can remain standing, please turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 10. I'll be reading from verse 9 through 13. And if you don't have access to a Bible, it will be displayed there on the screens. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 through 13. This is the word of God. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Well, as we take a break uh, this month, as we said last week from our series in the Gospel of John, last week we covered the dif difficult warning passage uh, from Hebrews chapter 2 that if the regular visible church attender does not focus their heart on, and mind on the true gospel, the author of Hebrews says you'll eventually drift away. And for some, I need to reiterate that I don't believe that if you've been truly saved by Jesus alone, by grace alone and through faith alone, that nothing can separate you from the love of Christ and that you can't lose your salvation. So, no, I don't believe you could, in the end, lose your salvation or be separated from the love of Christ if genuinely God has redeemed your heart. I still hold to this even while we can look at the five warning passages in the book of Hebrews. But what the author of Hebrews is describing is those in the visible church that seem to respond to the gospel with heartiness and joy at first, but eventually fall away. These are those described in the parable of the seed or the parable of the sower in Mark chapter 4, where Jesus is describing all the different scenarios and situations where someone might receive the seed, the word, at first with joy, but then tribulation or persecution comes, or the worries of the, of the, the world and, and all the thorns that come around and choke it out. And so, yes, there is this reality. We see this in the visible church all across the world, and of course in our own context, where you say this person or this coworker or this relative at first seemed to be very happy to hear about Jesus and about his word. But if God has truly not captured the heart that eventually because of the cares of this world or because of the rockiness of the soil of the heart uh, they flee and drift away this is what the author of hebrews was pointing to and what jesus is pointing to so it's not that somebody loses their salvation but it truly didn't set root truly in the heart to begin with but true faith will remain until the very end and this is a gift of god the preservation, the perseverance of the saints, we keep saying here, depends wholly on God, the true giver and sustainer. But then we are exhorted and urged, keep trusting all things to him. That's repeated in the book of Hebrews. With all the warnings in Hebrews, it's matched by even more references to say, and place and keep trusting in Jesus. But as an encouragement to you, I remember a professor from Australia, a well-known New Testament scholar named Peter T. O'Brien. He was a guest lecturer at Trinity, where I graduated from. And he was teaching a course over the semester on the book of Hebrews when I was in seminary. And when he was covering all the warning passages, I'll never forget his warning, but also his encouragement. He said something like this, if you're frightened about these warning passages, if you're wondering if you're drifting away, or if you're in the middle of some backsliding season and you're doubting your faith altogether, if there is this inward conviction about sin and not wanting to be where you're at, and you sense this is not who you are, or what you've been called to in the new life, he said that's a great indicator that the Holy Spirit is already in you, already convicting you. And so, he encouraged us, because he, he was saying for your congregants, your future congregants, or for your own self, a non-believer, someone who has not had the gospel rooted in their hearts, they would never care about a backsliding or about a doubting of their salvation or faith. 
And so he encouraged you, and I, and I thought I left l last week's morning message thinking, I hope I didn't discourage someone to say, well, all is lost, I'm drifting away. If there is a conviction in you that says, I don't want to drift away, Lord, I want to return to you, that's a really good indicator the Spirit's at work in you. But whatever your situation, as I concluded last week's sermon, whatever you're feeling, whatever you're experiencing in regards to Hebrews chapter 2, I want to be here for you in regards to just talking it out and praying for you and with you about just life's struggles, including the doubts that we face. But before we go on, as this is tied to now this topic of the Lordship of Jesus in your life in Romans 10, let's go again before the Lord praying. Father, we do ask that you help us in the Trinity, that you help us to see Jesus and his empowerment through your Holy Spirit, uh, through this text and this short passage, to be amazed at the Lordship and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. So thank you, Heavenly Father, for delivering us this word, and may our souls and hearts be impacted, and minds, this morning by the ministry and power of your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, every one of us, I'm sure, enjoys customization. We live in a world of customization, right? Your morning coffee that costs $8.50 because you need that, what, extra foam. Or you can't do regular milk, you need soy milk. And don't forget the fudge drizzle on top. I'm, I, I'm making this up, I don't drink coffee, but I, I can see the cost when I go to Starbucks. And say so you gotta do a second mortgage to, to go there every morning. Or dare I mention Chipotle again, I'm not sponsored, but I, it just fits. That glass barrier in front of us can't stop us from making 30 requests in two minutes while I totally bug them about, you know, to figure out, you know, Robin, what do you mean they know my name? I'm just kidding. You know, you know, just a little bit of brown rice, and then I take a minute, say, that's too much, and they just, it's like every grain is being dropped, and I said, that's it, that, that's good. We love customization. It's part of our nature. It's part of what we're used to. Or if you bought a new computer or a car or a new phone even, you can't keep up with all the specs that you can add or even subtract. Have you ever renovated your kitchen? All right, let's not go there. Or kids, you're not a, a, immune from customization, uh, the, the world either. Designer Barbies, designer stuffed animals that cost $85, online games, this is for maybe a short portion of our congregation where you can customize your, your own character. Or sports games, I used to do this a long time ago, where you can create your own version of yourself as a professional athlete. I finally made it, Mom. I, I, I am a legitimate professional athlete. I make myself really good. I give all these categories where I score 50 goals, but not so good, because you have to keep things a little bit real. We love customizing things in our world. It pervades all of life. In my graduate seminary years, I might have mentioned this over the years, I remember hearing a book that talked, the author talked about the designer God mentality in today's culture. They were writing the book from an, uh, an American perspective, not about how God really and truly created all things. He is the chief designer. That's not, that's not the premise there. But rather, this author was talking about how we want to design our own God today, to customize, because we're so used to doing so. That many in our world have this crazy, self-absorbed attitude that we somehow have the right to design our own Savior, our own Jesus even, to try to make him say what we want him to say, to make him act the way we want him to act to make our own God that caters to our wants and inclinations, even if they're even sinful. That's what is meant by this author's talking about. We live in a desire, designer God world. From very early on, we are drawn to this innate desire to make things for our own taste, to personalize, to make it all about us. Why do I say an innate desire? Because we learned it from sin, passed down from the very first created human being, Adam. Adam and Eve, they wanted to create their own designer God in Genesis chapter 3. They wanted to customize him. They didn't like how God had mastery over them, that he had the power to restrict. They wanted to do things on their own terms, and so would we. 
And this is where sin entered into the world, the scriptures say. And as a reminder, sin is idolatry. Sin is desiring to yank back control and be your own Lord. You see, idolatry always questions God's word, just like Adam and Eve questioned God's word. But brothers and sisters, again, this is nothing new. From Genesis 3 to then, in the days of Moses, the worship of the golden calf, to the, war, the worship of foreign gods in the history of Israel, to the paganism in the days of the Greco-Roman context of the early church, the designer God mentality is nothing new. And many of us have many thoughts on our culture and the problems associated with our culture, but it's not as easy to say everyone else is wrong and skewed and led astray, but I never struggle with this type of idolatry because it's more pervasive even in the lo local church than we casually might actually think. When Christianity only becomes cultural to us and not a genuine expression of true trusting faith in Jesus, then the designer God mentality has already set its roots. In today's vernacular or way of speaking, some have called this concern easy believism. Easy believism. It's a phrase often used for today's sentiment that as long as you go to church sometimes, as long as you do some good deeds here and there, that as long as you're pretty moral and just say the rehearsed religious lines when needed, then golly, we're good to go. Heaven just can't wait for us to get there, some might think or say. And we miss the biblical definition of who Jesus is, why he came to die, how we fit in the biblical plan of redemption, the Father's will, what the gospel is, how we are to be transformed by the gospel, how we are actually called to deny ourselves, to take up our own crosses, and to follow Jesus. And I think like every generation that was called to repentance and revival and renewal, oh, we see indeed the formula is there's always a return to the Lord through his word. And in his word, we'll understand who we're worshiping and why, what awesome sacrifice was made that redeemed us and reconciled us to God, who we are called to follow, what the following looks like, what we are to focus our lives on now, what we are to then devalue, and so on and so forth. Because if we're not grounded in the word, both as individuals or as a church, it's such an easy, slippery slope that we fall into as we try to make our own designer Christianity, our own designer Lord, or even our own designer Bible. I told you months ago about my relative's church that starts the Lord's Prayer, Our Heavenly Mother. How do we get to that conclusion as a church? It doesn't happen overnight, I, I guarantee that. But it's the slow, slippery slope of saying, I want to design my own version of God, of Christianity, of Jesus, or how I want to obey and follow. And so although the passage today is Romans 10, 9 through 11, let me just focus on the first two verses of 9 and 10. I have your Bibles open if you can, because I want us to realize what is meant by Jesus being our Lord through the eyes of Paul and the early apostles and not the designer God version or easy believism, the customizable version of what lordship should resemble. If you've been attending Westminster for any amount of months or years, you know that we want to be gospel-centered and grace-obsessed. I think we've spoken a lot about Jesus as savior and the justifier of sinners and the redeemer of God's chosen people. But perhaps we need to also concentrate on Jesus as savior, but also as our Lord. Look at verse 9 and 10 again, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. You know, this doctrine of the lordship of Jesus was a controversial topic a couple of decades ago in the evangelical world. Lordship isn't just something that comes after salvation, though. It's part of the salvation process to start with. Because as we'll see today, Paul is talking about what saving faith is and what it does in the believer. You see, in verse 9 through 10, this is right in the middle of chapter 10, if you have your whole Bibles open, and it's in the middle of a thought from Paul. So let me just summarize what is actually happening before we return here. Paul, in this chapter, is longing for Jews to be saved. It's a 
a desperate longing for his own people to believe in Jesus, but most are rejecting him. In the beginning verses, Paul is basically stating that the unbelieving Jews are so stuck in the thought that they're right with God because of their own quote-unquote righteousness, meaning their own righteous works or outward behaviors. Paul calls it their zeal for the Lord, but he says that actually doesn't save. Earlier in in chapter 10, verse 3 through 4, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Paul is summarizing that the end of the era of the old covenant has come to completion and utter fulfillment because Jesus had come to fulfill the law perfectly in his life, death, and resurrection. The new has come. But these unbelieving Jews were not seeing it. They wanted to remain and abide in the old system. This is why people were also drifting in the context of the book of Hebrews. There was, a, there was a variety of reasons, including persecution or worship of different things and entities, but one of the main things of drifting away is because less of the gospel, less of Jesus, more of the old covenant, please. And it was a slow drift away from God. And a system of the law that Paul says in Romans chapters 1 and 2 at the very beginning that everyone, everybody utterly, completely fails. There is not one hope to be saved through the Mosaic law, but it must be of faith and faith in Jesus alone. But the Jews kept rejecting it. Their hearts were hardened to it. And Paul then uses some passages from Leviticus and Deuteronomy in the earlier portion of this chapter to show that even in the Old Testament view of the law, Christ has come to fulfill it and reinterpret it. The basic summary is what God requires is not superhuman good works, but true faith in the gospel Paul preaches. And he gets the last bit from verse 8. But what does it say? The the word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Faith in the one proclaimed who is Jesus Christ in his perfect finished work. And so so I had to summarize. If we're to look at today's passage, we definitely had to summarize where he's coming from. But back to 9 and 10. Basically, Paul talks about two critical things when it comes to salvation. True salvation. And we'll share later how these just don't stop at the moment of salvation, but it continues. And the first one we've already covered, number one, is that there must be saving faith. Again, verse 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you can underline this, believe in your heart. And then later in 10, for the heart, for with the heart one believes, you can circle or underline that. And in these verses, he's describing faith as believing in, a trusting in and not of yourself. Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is believing in all that was hoped for. The truth that Jesus died for our sins, actually. Not just a myth, but literally, historically, he came 2,000 years ago. He suffered on the hand of, hands of men. He was crucified. He died for our sins. He was literally, historically buried but then also literally bodily resurrected by the power of the Spirit. And later, as 1 Corinthians 15 says, the first uh, uh, importance of the gospel ascended to sit at the right hand of the Father. We define here that faith is a total trusting in the person finished work of Christ, that is perfect life, death, and resurrection when believed in, and the ability to believe is a gift of God's grace and uh, an undeserved grace. That's what saves us. We just follow the New Testament formula that we are saved through faith by grace in Christ alone, Ephesians 2.8. Not our record of good works, not even our persevering saves us, but faith in Jesus and his finished work. And as it says in verse 10, for with the heart one believes and is justified. Here Paul is not describing the heart as, uh, Robin, out of your sheer, genuine, uh, um, just, you know, perfect, honest emotions that if you have that kind of faith from the heart and are justified, then you're credited before righteousness. Because we in the Western world, we look at the heart in the context of our feelings, of our emotions. But in the Bible, when it says heart, it's your central command center. I've mentioned this several times now. You think about a train station underground and all these moving parts and trains and inroads and outroads, but there's one command center somewhere in the city that directs all the traffic 
And that's what the Bible says is your heart. The central command center. When the Bible talks about the heart, it refers to this in this context. It's basically a reference to the inner core of our souls that God created from the beginning of time that believes in and trusts in him. And the more and more you learn about what faith is from the depths of the heart, the more you will be convinced that there isn't any way possible that any person could believe in God this way from the depths of their souls. There has to be a divine intervention. And that intervention is God and his spirit. Totally impossible on our own. And that's what makes faith such a gift and is so remarkable. But we get this because we are tempted this every day. The Pharisees had their own zeal and quote-unquote good works to try to convince themselves and others that they were okay. But true believers have only but their faith that was gifted them by God that brought wretched lost hearts to peace. You could, I'm not going to go into it again, but just read the story of the reformer Martin Luther who had to exchange that in his heart as a gift of God and just come to the Lord with empty hands to receive this gift. So what is faith saying? This faith, this believing in, this trusting in Jesus allows the second part to naturally then happen. And number two is this, you must confess that Jesus is Lord. There are many people even today that says you don't really need to do that. But yes, saving faith naturally is chained to, connected to, confessing that Jesus is your Lord. Verse 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and at the end of verse 10, and with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. And as I said at the start, there's been a lot of controversy over the years about Christians professing Christ as Lord. Some say it's only about faith and you don't have to confess Jesus as Lord because we're only saved by faith. And I would say, amen, we're only saved by faith alone. But that faith ultimately involves confession and owning up to the fact that Jesus is Lord over all, just like repentance is like a twin grace for salvation. Our repenting and believing are twin graces, gifts from God. Lordship is part of all that, the understanding of who we are believing in. You can't repent to a holy God if you do not consider him also your Lord. In a way, it's like trying to argue that trees are only its roots and trunk, and all the branches and leaves are something entirely different. It's all part of the tree. Confessing the Lord is completely part of what it is to believe in Jesus, that he is not only Savior to your soul, but is also your new Lord. And you're confessing that. That's why the whole process of what baptism symbolizes. Earlier today, I asked Jessica, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God? Another way people get it wrong is that we all have to do it all we have to do is just kind of robotically move our mouths. This is what confessing lordship is. They interpret the statement that if you just say these magical words, my seventh grade camp, Bible camp, I, I, I moved my mouth and I said those words, the rest of my life I'm just okay. And so usually people think, sometimes, you know, I grew up Baptist, so you had these altar calls, and some, some of my friends said I, I went ten times up to the altar over five years to be saved over and over again. And I'm not saying that just to be funny. I mean, some of my friends were really confused about this. They would confess with their mouth. They would be up in front of everybody. They would look up to God. I confess as you, my Lord. They would go and struggle with sin. And they would say, I must not be a Christian. And they come back and say, I confess that you are Lord. And it was just that kind of mechanical moving of their mouths to say, this is what brings me assurance. But no, this is not what the Bible means by confession and confessing. It's not mystical. It's not a superficial religious formula. What is Paul really speaking about? In the early church, when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, it entails something far greater than audible sounds coming out of your mouth. It meant, I can die for this, and I'm ready. It's a symbolic way of total acceptance 
to Christ as Lord. In the ancient context, again, allegiance to a family name. Like if you were a bond servant and you had to confess allegiance to your master, you would do this kind of formal, I confess my loyalty to you. Or if it was to the Roman Empire, this is again an ancient context, confessing something to your Caesar. That wasn't just a mechanical thing. They knew exactly what that meant. <laughs> that brought a lot of suffering and hardship, of course. To use an, ex an opposite example, it's not as if you're born, if you were born mute or without a tongue that you can't go to heaven. And so back to the early church, when you confessed Jesus is Lord, it went hand in hand with your heart's conviction and your heart's belief and faith in Jesus himself. One commentator states that such a confession is inseparable from a heart conviction. You can't fake it to make it, but your heart needs to believe, and out of the heart conviction, something comes out. Yes, audibly for those who profess Christ, but really it's that allegiance to him. It involves, he goes on to say, personal trust. He says, Paul asserts that belief in the lordship of Jesus and his resurrection, which Romans 1.4 says is inseparable. He was appointed as Lord over us at his resurrection. Those are necessary for salvation. Necessary for salvation. Meaning salvation naturally includes a believing, trusting in the work of Christ and is a confession and confessing unto of who Jesus is. We sing this, we sing it today, we sing it most weeks. Jesus is Lord. This is antithetical to the designer God mentality that we live in today. But what the Word of God says, who Jesus is. I really love that reference in Romans 1 4 and was declared to be the Son of God and power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. That's so encouraging. That if you have faith in Jesus, that means you believe in him and confess him as the Son of God, the resurrected Christ our Lord. And so I can't assume, every Sunday I can't assume who is in the visible church, who comes on a random Sunday. And so we can always ask every week, are you believing in Christ as your Savior, the one who died for your sins and was raised from the grave in victory? Are you believing it from the depths of your soul, the heart? not just an intellectual assent. Yeah, I guess I believe there's a God. I guess I can believe miracles can happen, but a deep rooted belief in the work and person of Jesus. And if you are, is it coupled with the acceptance that you confess who Jesus really is, Savior, but also Lord? I think for all of us, it's a serious question to ask, but also to confront in a loving manner those around you in your lives. John 3, 36 says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. I like to quote New Testament scholar D.A. Carson a lot. He lends this, quote, it is true, of course, that no man enters the kingdom because of his obedience, but it is equally true that no man enters the kingdom who is not obedient. Close quote. That's a th serious thought to pray over. Now, let me encourage you right now, or some of you might fall into deep discouragement this day. When we are saved, it doesn't mean that we all just, all of a sudden, perfectly submit. We perfectly surrender everything to Christ as Lord, 100%. But there's definitely the letting go part of saying and confessing, Jesus, you are Lord. I want you to be Lord over my life. You are the Lord over all things. But, oh, Lord, how I need you. Oh, God, how I need you. There's obviously sin involved in our lives still until the day we meet him in glory. We still tend to rebel. We struggle with idols still. We struggle with sin, besetting sins. But the important, the important point is the lordship of Christ, the desire for his lordship, the acceptance of the lordship, the turning away from sin as masters, Romans 6 says, should be an organic outflow of what is happening in our conversion, what has happened in our conversion. True, the rate of transformation is different for every person. In this room, there is such a different rate of people where they are in the sanctification process of, of the true lording of Jesus over your life. But if you're worried or concerned, 
about what's going on, who else to turn to except Jesus? I can lend you sympathies and empathies and words of encouragement. I could point you to the scriptures, but I can't do what Jesus can do for your heart right now. And so it's better to be honest with the Lord and to say and have that attitude and disposition as the father of the boy who was possessed with an evil spirit who was later healed by Jesus. Mark chapter 9, where the father says, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. In that one humble phrase and sentence and thought, there is this submitting to the lordship of Christ. I do believe. Help me overcome in my life, in this instance, my unbelief. Help me acknowledge and look to you as the Savior, Messiah, but also as my Lord, because I want to trust in you. I might have shared the story of one of my PCA mentors in my mid-20s, who I think is still pastoring somewhere in Florida right now. But when I was in Virginia, he was mentoring me. He really taught me, honestly, a wonderful presentation of the gospel. He was a godly man. And he shared a story to us that really shook me in my 20s, but made me really think about faith, acceptance, conversion, Jesus as Lord and Savior, what that's all about. He shared to the discipleship group of 15, and I was a part of that, <clears throat> that he grew up in a Christian home. He did the whole church thing. I think his father was a pastor also. He grew up and eventually went to seminary to follow the footsteps of his father to become a pastor. But something was off. There was something that my mentor at that age in his life would not surrender to Christ. He readily admitted to us, this is some 20 years after, that he was a fornicator. He had a lot of trouble fooling around with women, and it was constant, even in his seminary years. And it wasn't until somebody confronted him with the Bible and said to him, I know what you're doing. The reputation is out there. I know what you're doing right now. And the scriptures say, people who fornicate, you know that passage. But in that category of fornication, as you do, and you live totally unrepentant of this, will not inherit eternal life. And of course, he knew this reference passage very well. He's in seminary. But it just broke him. It dawned on him that he had not truly trusted in Jesus. He simply didn't want God to lord over his life in every way. So he repented from that moment forward and really thought about what faith is all about. And he believed he got saved during that time, even though he was already in seminary. He said it was the first time he had actually placed his trust and faith in the saving Christ, but also submitted to the lordship of Jesus. Amazing, isn't it? After all those years going to church, even going down that road to become a pastor, even though you have the example of your father being a pastor, that this could be so delayed. A humbling and sobering story that caused actually me to rethink easy believism at that time and just going through the religious motions and not really thinking about Jesus as Savior but also as Lord. And I don't know, I have to wait till heaven to really figure this out and... and, and and for God to tell me when I was regenerated, but even though I grew up in church, I shared this before, I think it was in my mid-20s or upper 20s when I was convicted. I think now the Lord has regenerated my heart. But hold on. Do I believe Christians can still fall and sin? Yes. Do I believe some Christians can suffer from some type of really deep-seated struggle with besetting sin? Yes. But what is off is when you just don't care for Christ's lordship at all. If you sin and you know it's wrong and you desire to change and turn away and submit to the lordship of Christ, like I said from Peter T. O'Brien, that's a pretty good sign that something transformative is already there by the ministry of his Holy Spirit. That faith is active in your beating heart. That your trusting is in another to save you. And that you're not saved from your own strength. But for any of us or anyone that we know that is close to us that has the kind of, you know, religious kind of marker over them, those that just say, oh, whatever, live as you please, and let sin run its course without remorse, whatever, without any inkling of a pattern of repentance, I don't think it's any revelation to say that's lordless Christianity. That's reverting back to designer God customize how I like it to be Christianity. 
and a serious, genuine speaking in truth and love needs to happen, <laughs> either to yourself or to others who might be in this season. Now, having said all of that, to those that are submitted to the Lordship of Christ and faith and trust, there are these benefits at the remaining portion of this chapter. Let me pick it up again, Romans 10, 11. We'll really quickly go through this. For the scripture says, Paul says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's a reference, of course, to Joel chapter 2, read earlier today. But if we listen to the enemy long enough, and as a result, listen to the designer God nonsense that's out there, then we'll start to think that the Lordship of Christ is just a pain to deal with a fun stopper. But the Bible says differently. This is, I really, as I conclude here in the next couple of minutes, really want to hammer on. The Bible says this is not some, oh, let's just snuff out all the fun of life and, and remove all joy. Lordship equates to true peace and true joy. The Bible says we find true peace in him. The Bible says here that the Lord of all richly blesses all who call on him, meaning the Lord, as we are submitted to him in faith and allegiance, blesses us in spiritual ways that we couldn't even ever imagine. And Paul is probably saying, don't settle for the scraps of lordless living. And I take that for myself too. But on the flip side, rejoice in the blessings of Christ, in his lordship over you, in his salvation for us. And for all of eternity, there won't be any shame, as it says in verse 11. This is the result of being founded in faith in Jesus, aligned under the lordship of Jesus. And so how do I summarize this in just really short application? Number one is this, your point of conversion is just the beginning of faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord. It's just the beginning. And secondly, the Lordship of Christ should be viewed as this, again, a, a very joyful and positive transformation, transformative change in you. Who wouldn't want to come and submit to the humble King, Jesus as Lord? Number three, Lordship of Jesus thankfully serves as a way to sanctify you. Think of all the ways the Lord needed to convict you, to relinquish, to put off, as then you put on Jesus and the things above. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, I love this verse, and take every thought captive to obey Christ. One author wrote on this verse, every idea, motive, desire, and decision belongs to Christ. And so I would say that's part of our view of the Lordship of Jesus. And finally, of course, flee every temptation to create or customize your own version of Christianity or even your attempts to try to create an image of God himself who can never be changed, who can never be tricked or deceived, who will never conform his likeness to us based on our desires and whims, but he remains immutable, unshakable, and by his power, he conforms us, yes, to his perfect likeness out of grace to the day we see him face to face. Friends, lordship matters. This is not a message just for college kids returning back to school and learning who knows what's out there, but this is for every age, every life season, because we are daily confronted with a designer, customizable mentality. But as we cling to faithful reading, as we cling to faithful proclaiming and teaching of the Holy Scriptures, oh, may our Savior and Lord teach us all these good things. That Lordship is not a swinging bat around to get people to shape up and are you, are you submitting to the Lordship of Christ? That's not the message that I want you to go home with. But Lordship is an invitation that is full of grace and truth that can only lead to joy and greater joy the type of lordship that says from Jesus in Matthew 11, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is that Lord. Let's pray. Father, we, many of us are coming with heavy laden hearts, laboring for our own self-justification that we're good enough to stay saved or be saved. 
And so, yes, we receive this call and we want to be invited again and again and we want to take you up on the offer to come to you and to find rest and joy in Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Father, there's nothing, not even one ounce in ourselves that would want this, but by your Spirit would you help us to sit at the feet of Jesus under his tutelage, under his saving grace and mercy, but also his Lordship that conforms us by your Holy Spirit more and more unto him. Thank you that you sent Jesus to be our Savior and Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.